Hi, everybody. So today I'm going to talk about automating data science drudgery with Pixie Dust. I'm a developer advocate at IBM, and I work a lot with the uh, Watson Studio product, which is our premier cloud native data science platform. It's a combination. It gives you access to Jupyter Notebooks work and our studio work if you're more of coming from more of a statistical statistician background and provides it all in a collaborative environment with a lot of additional um, add-ons, extensions, specific to the IBM platform, like IBM machine learning, and, uh, and a bunch of other things, which we won't have time to get into today, because I'm gonna focus in exclusively on working in Jupyter Notebooks. I'm gonna talk about an extension that my team developed over the last couple of years for Jupyter Notebooks called Pixie Dust. And it's a little helper that you install into Jupyter Notebooks, and it just automates a lot of the commands that you'd have to do on your, that you, that you could write yourself, but are a real pain to write. And I'm gonna, first of all, I'm gonna talk about why it's important, why that increases productivity, and how it just makes your, makes your professional life better. And then I'm gonna spend most of the time uh, demoing that tool. And showing you how it works. So first of all, a lot of people don't get this, so I'm going to spend a, a good bit of time on talking about why Pixie Dust is important. And the point here at the end of this whole uh, section of the discussion is it really just provides you with less context switching. Nothing that you couldn't do on your own, but it uh, takes away, not only reduces the time to getting insights from your data. It also uh, stops your brain from having to think about things that aren't really that important. So let's talk about our day as a data science professional. How do you spend your time? So I think this is the way we would imagine a perfect day. Go to work, get into work for an eight hour day, and we spend 100% of our time just doing really good productive uh, programming on analytics. That's not really the way things ever happen. You might think that, well, you know, I might actually be really productive coding 50% of the time. The other half of the time, I'll be learning a new function or looking up some commands or looking up the details of some command that I know, but there's always a couple little intricacies I forget or you know, I need a new little, I need a new, new little option in a command I use a lot. A lot of time is spent on Stack Overflow and documentation and getting environment variables set up and file import and all that stuff. So then we all work in an organization or most of us work in an organization where there's a lot of meetings, email, you know, a lot of things you just have to do to keep the business running and you have to participate in uh you know, work is a group thing. You have to you have to do a lot of stuff just to make the organization keep going. So now we're down to well, maybe you spend a third of my time doing that kind of meetings, admin stuff, expense reports, and a third of my time doing really productive coding, and then a third, you know, just uh, making sure my coding is productive. <clears throat> and then you add in there, you know, communi communications tools. Now and nowadays, more and more people are spending a lot of time on Slack, trying to keep up with every conversation going on in your in your company. And so maybe that takes about 20 percent of your time. And now we're down to maybe, you know, 25, 25 percent of our time actually spent doing our job. And that's split up between productive coding and documentation. But then I read an interesting article recently that said, well, actually going back and forth between all of these things, you know, checking email, checking some messages on Slack, reading a thread, responding to somebody, all that stuff just completely switches context for you, puts yourself in a whole nother mindset, getting back to what you were actually doing, getting back to your flow, your productive work, uh, takes a lot of time, maybe 15, 20 minutes just to get back to the point where you were being productive. So. 30% of our time, this is a really important, profound number, 30% of our time 
is actually spent in this time of sort of doing nothing, just having our brains switch back and forth between tasks and getting, and getting, getting our brains firmly placed within the mindset where we can deal with that task appropriately. So if you, if you carve out 30% of our time for context switching, now everything else gets reduced and you're left to, you know, I'm making up numbers here to make a point, but you know, now you've really cut into all your time for, for productive coding. The meetings don't go away. The meetings don't get shorter. You can't tell people, oh, you know, let's cut this meeting in half because uh, I don't think it's important enough. You know, you still have to do that stuff. There's a lot of stuff that goes on, and now we're down to a very, the point here is that the time we spent in productive coding and actually gaining insights from the data we're looking at is extremely precious. So I actually, I threw 30% number on that pie chart for context switching, but the number I got from the article I read actually said 40%. And you know you can go look up this article. The URL is in the uh, is in the presentation. But some really uh, really startling numbers here: more than thirty one work weeks lost each year to context switching, forty percent time used to switch tasks, mental blocks, multitasking leading to mistakes, and four times longer to recognize new things when multitasking. That's a huge important point, especially for this talk. So. You know, you may be able to context switch a little better when you're doing stuff you've done over and over again that you're familiar with. Um, if you're trying to learn something new, forget about it. You know, you cannot be deluged with all the things going on in a work day and learn something new in any kind of efficient time frame. So another point of uh, just another little point of fact here. So. Somebody did a survey, not a huge survey, only 45 developers, but 60% of two thirds of them reported that frustration is a severe problem and that the, uh, that a big part of that is high cognitive complexity and time pressure. So if you're a data scientist, you're doing very complicated things. You're trying to learn new things all the time, most likely, and you're under pressure to get something done you know, on a pretty tight time frame while you're context switching. <laughs> so, you know, 10 minutes later, you should understand why less context switching is huge, hugely important. And that's what we hope to uh, offer with the Pixie Dust extension. So let's jump into some, some demos of how it works. So I am going to leave my presentation here and jump into a live demonstration. So I'm gonna log out just to show you from the beginning. So Pixie Dust is an open source extension to the open source Drupal notebook platform. So you can use it on, you don't have to use any IBM product to use Pixie Dust. You can just download Jupyter notebooks from uh, jupyter.org and you can and run it on your desktop no, there's no dependency on any on any commercial product. I'm going to show it. You can also use it on any cloud-based platform that supports Jupyter Notebooks. And IBM Watson Studio is one such product. So the URL here is dataplatform.cloud.ibm.com. I'm going to log in here to show you how it works. So if you don't have an account, if you go to that URL, you'll be prompted to sign up for an account. I'll go through my login process and I'm gonna be presented with a really full featured collaborative data science platform here. But so this is the IBM Watson Studio product. I got projects, tools is interesting. Like I mentioned earlier, you have the uh, options to work within our studio. Jupyter Notebooks, um, some other IBM specific tools like Modeler and Data Refinery. Data Refinery is very cool. It's a, it's a cloud-based offering dedicated to helping you clean and shape data before you start working on it. There's a metadata catalog available and more. 
So I'm going to go into, I have a product, project set up here called Conferences, where I put a lot of the uh, presentations I'm, or the notebooks I'm going to do for conferences. And within a project, you can have, you go to the Overview tab here, you can have collaborators, you can have a bunch of different um, data science assets. Collaborators is important because you can, you know, you can work collaboratively on a notebook, share it over the, share it across uh, across uh, collaborators. I go to settings, see there are various tools you can put into your project, storage, um, other analytic services from the IBM cloud you can put in here, which helps you. Although they have REST-based APIs often, it's easier to associate the services with your project directly so that you get access to the uh, credentials needed to, to run them. And various other things like uh, their Python uh, environments is about what version of Python you want to use and how, how, uh, how much computing resource you want to dedicate to that project you can sign up for you can pay extra for more cpus and things like that but i'm going to go right to assets you'll see we have some data assets some uh, csv files machine learning model in here I'm not going to use that today i'm just going to jump right in here to my data science community day notebook okay so now i'm inside basically a, a Jupyter notebook with a little bit of a modified user interface from IBM. But uh, if you don't know how Jupyter notebooks, what they are, basically a uh, browser-based browser platform to write Python code. And there's nothing you can do in the notebook that you couldn't do in Python standalone, but it allows you to write Python code and annotate it with some markdown. As you see right here, I have a nice bold title for this notebook and some, you know, textual notes. You can put graphics in there. Most most anything you can put into an HTML page, you can put around your Python code. So I'm going to start running this cell by cell. First thing I do is import Pixie Dust, and the first feature of Pixie Dust I'm going to show you is the sample data command, the ability to import um, CSV files. So a lot of things are happening in this sample data command. I'm choosing number seven, which Pixie Dust has about 10 built-in sample data sets. This doesn't have to be a number. It could be a URL to a CSV file anywhere on the internet. And what Pixie Dust will do is bring in that CSV file, uh, analyze the schema, Try to make good guesses about what type of uh, what type of what data type each column is. Set that up properly, and put that CSV file into a data frame. Now here I've specified force pandas equals true. If you don't specify that, it will put it into a Spark data frame. If you specify force pandas equals true, it will put it into a pandas data frame. Just for Ease of use here, performance reasons. I'm using, I'm making sure I'm using pandas instead of Spark. If it was a, you know, multi gigabyte data set, I'd probably use uh, Spark instead. It's pandas data frames require all the data to be in memory. So the next command I ran was display df. Display is another Pixie Dust command, which initializes what you see right here, this menu system. So if you've done any charting and graphing in, in a Jupyter notebook, you, you know that you have to type all the commands yourself. You have to choose a uh, graphics library like matplotlib or seaborn or bouquet, and then you have to learn the commands there, and then you can get started. Pixie Dust puts all that stuff behind a menuing system. So I'm going to start off with the simplest feature of Pixie Dust, which is showing you your data, a preview of your data in a nice table. I click that table button here. One area, schema. So you'll see the CSV file I pulled in here. 
for Boston crime data. Has three fields, domestic, district, day of week. So these are all the crimes in Boston for a particular time frame. And there's a domestic flag, whether it's domestic violence, what district, police district it took place in, and what day of the week it happened on. I can go in here. Oh, look at this. I have other columns in here. I clicked on the options button. Include the month in my data frame, something like that. All these different columns. Instead of looking up the commands, the particular commands, to, I mean, I've been doing data science in Jupyter Notebooks for a couple of years now, and still I forget the difference between the Spark command to show, to high, you know, to remove it, to remove a column from the data frame versus the pandas command. Um, I always, you know, have to look up these little details to get the exact correct syntax, number of rows to display. Maybe I only need to look at 100, speed things up a little bit. So that's nice. Oh, I want to search for a particular value in the table. Not a great example here, but I'll show you type ahead works. All of a sudden, I'm just seeing Tuesdays. So that's you know, nice, but pretty basic. I'm going to go back to that. Oh, I did it so fast, you probably didn't realize. Then under this menu are all the visualization options that we have available. Bar, bar chart, line chart, scatter plot, pie chart, map, and histogram. Let's make a little simple bar chart of this data. Um, my configuration settings had been saved already. I'll show you what I did to get that. Nice bar chart in about five seconds. So a bar chart has two axes, an X and a Y. We're calling them keys and values. The keys are the X along the, along the bottom axis. So what I want to look at is the day of the week field. And the value I want to look at is the sum here, the aggregation technique, sum of street crimes. So street crime is just a, a value, one or zero. It says whether or not it's a street crime. And I'm going to use 10,000 rows of the data. So this is saying for each day of the week, sum up street crimes. You OK? And I get all my days of the week and the number of street crimes that happened. If you're going to be showing this to somebody else, they might want to, you know, better understand your data with a nice title. So it's always a good, always good practice to title your visualizations. Look here, I have a drop down menu here of different renders available to me. Orientation horizontal, horizontal or vertical. Quickly do that. If you like, we have an experimental feature in here called D3 rendering, which gives you, uh, which uh, renders this as SVG, a graph, giving you the ability to zoom in. To a particular area. I'm not going to get into too many of these features right now because you can play around with them, but they are, you know, all these things would take would take hours if you didn't already know these features to, to implement. But also, even if you do know them, it's just so nice to be able to just execute them within seconds instead of spending the time to go and look up, you know, the the one little detail of a command that you just don't quite remember. Once, once again, it takes us back to context switching. Don't leave, don't stop focusing on your data. Often when you're, you know, intensely working on one of these projects, you've got the data in your head, you've got some picture of the data in the head, some idea of what you're trying to do, and you don't want to lose that by going outside of this environment and trying to, you know, look up, figure out what you're doing. As soon as you get on the web browser, who knows what you're going to, you know, get distracted by. So you can quickly just play around with different visualizations. So I'm going to go to, let's look at another way to 
visualize our data. So I'm trying to get an idea of where street crime is happening. So maybe I really want to look at the, maybe I really want to look at the uh, police district. Is there a district that crimes happen more in than others? So let's get rid of this day of the week key. Let's not look at it by day of week, but let's look at crimes per district. Wow. Okay, so one really stands out here, D4. That's interesting. Okay, so D4 seems like I need to know what's happening in police district D4, but it would really help if I could map that because as you can see here, so we've got some high values, A1, B2, C11, and then D, D4 really stands out. Are these near each other? Is there some spatial relationship there? Uh, why are these lower? If I'm doing an analysis of street crime in Boston, I probably know the city a little bit, so I'd, the first thing I'd want to do is look at these on a map. So I am going to copy this cell, copy, and then paste. It's probably hard for you to tell what I'm doing here, but you see this, you know, there's a copy select cell button and then a paste cell below button. So this copies the commands. I'm going to delete that command which brought in the uh, data because I don't need to bring it in again. It's still stored in my in my notebook. I'm just going to run this, this pixie dust display command again. It also brought along all the metadata for the cell. I'm going to show you that actually. It's a useful thing to know about. View cell toolbar and this isn't just the IBM um, Watson Studio platform. Regular Jupyter Notebooks have this option as well. So I'm going to turn on the cell toolbar edit metadata, which gives you a button up here in the, in the top right corner of your cell. Clicked on the wrong one. Which shows you some internal metadata for you. Each cell can have its own uh, metadata stored in a JSON format. And programs, code that you write within that cell can, can access this metadata. So you'll see whenever I was clicking around in that, in that Pixie Just interface, I was actually changing this JSON metadata for the cell. You know, you may have noticed when well, I talked about having an aggregation value of sum, I showed you earlier that the fields I was displaying were just day of the week, district and domestic, but there were other fields in the data frame I wasn't showing. The render I was using was matplotlib. I made a bar chart and my X value or key field was district. I did not show a legend. I gave it a title. And then the, the field I was actually, um, you know, visualizing, the thing I was making a graph of was the street crime field. So I just copied all that metadata over to here, ran, ran the pixie dust display command again, and I got the same exact visualization. And I copied that because I want to keep that one. Now I want to play around with making a map. So I go to map. It doesn't know what to do with the configuration parameters I had set up. So I don't get a good picture back. Oh, and notice here it says no map box action, no map box access token available. This is because for mapping for the base map for the underlying map that shows streets and and town names and all those uh, sort of you know things you expect to get for free, separate from your data that you're working with, we're using a great third party provider called company called Mapbox, which. Uh, which you know provides uh, web mapping services for for companies, and I'm using I'm using a I will be using a built-in token that they've let us use just to demo the Mapbox product. But you should really get your own if you do this in any serious way. So we automatically populate this demo key. But now when you're doing a map, it's a little bit different from a chart, from a bar chart or a line chart. Your key values, you have two now instead of one. 
because we're making a two-dimensional visualization instead of a, you know, usually bar charts or uh, I call them one-dimensional graphics. So we need two keys. We need the X value and the Y value, latitude and longitude. We're still going to look at the street crime um, indicator. We're going to use 10,000 rows. Won't worry about colors for now. So some of this language may not be familiar to you if you were, if you're not, you know, a seasoned professional in mapping. But once again, you didn't have to be. If all I, you could probably make this graphic again, this visualization again, just because I told you you need a latitude and longitude value in your keys options here. If in it, if you had to write this code by hand, it would probably take you a couple of days to learn the basics of how to do it. I'm going to change this from the default to just a simple. Actually, that was wrong. What I'd like to do is not cluster these values. This is one way to read the map. You can see that right in the middle there's a three, and right above that there's a 446. That's one way to, you know, see how many crimes are occurring in a particular place. Not the best way to get a quick idea of the spatial dispersion of the data. I find that a better way is to just map all the points as circles, bump the transparency up or the opacity down, whichever way you want to think of it, and then the data will, uh, more data in a particular place will appear as a darker, as a darker red color here. A lot of crimes in Boston for this particular period, so it's still all showing up red, mostly. But as I zoom in, you'll see that, okay, this is a better view. So I'm zoomed into the heart of Boston and you'll see that, okay, so there is a, you know, you can start seeing patterns of really bright red versus lighter areas where the transparency is showing through. So you know the really, you know, bright red areas have multiple, many crimes on top of each other. If I'm interested in a particular area, I can, uh, you know, zoom in and get more information on those. So I'm doing a simple map. Uh, choropleth is an interesting word. So chlor choropleth basically means uh, assign different colors to the data based on based on the value. So here I'm doing yellow to blue, where more values, if the number is higher, in my particular case, street crime number is higher, it'll be, it'll be a darker blue. And as you get lower, the bottom ranges of the data, it'll be yellow. And then you can change the number of, the number of groups. I've grouped the data into five different categories here, but you can change that too. You can group all your data, you know, statistical binning methodologies into play there. So I'm going to, I'm going to uh, start grabbing questions in a minute. But I'm going to finish off with one more little. So that was a little exploration on the fly. I actually hadn't pre-prepared that at all. I just went into the data, decided I was going to make a map on that data. What I had prepared earlier was to talk, was to switch data sets and look at um, home sales in Boston. So I'll just show that really quickly. So once more, I'm pulling in sample data number six now, which you'll see down here actually, you know, translates into a URL on GitHub. Sample data set we have, milliondollarhomes.csv. So this is million dollar home sales in Massachusetts, eastern Massachusetts um, from last year. I had to think about that a second, make sure it's still last year. And then we use the pixie dust display command again. So a lot of this is the same, I'm only showing this one because I know the data looks good. 
you can really see some spatial patterns. My specialty is mapping. That's why I'm doing a lot of mapping here. I actually am the developer of this uh, particular part of Pixie Dust. So if you have questions at the end, particularly on mapping, uh, I'm your person. So I will zoom in here and you'll see a really, you know, it's nice to see data visually. I use this uh, million dollar home sales data set because real estate is so location driven. It makes a great demonstration of looking at spatial patterns uh, in the real world for data. So first thing that jumps out, hey, all these million dollar home, a lot of the million dollar home sales are on the ocean. That makes sense. People like to live on the ocean. Another thing that jumps out is, oh, okay, and then there's a huge cluster here in the middle. Well, that's downtown Boston. People like to live in cities, so home prices are higher in cities and home prices are higher on um, places where, where the natural resources are really great, ocean views. You can zoom in here. Okay, now we look at Boston. We'll see some more subtle spatial patterns like, wow, so right here along the river. This is a very exclusive part of Boston. So not only are we right downtown in the city, a lot of very walkable, a lot of great restaurants and shops and all that stuff, but we're also on the waterfront. So you get, you know, the perfect storm of high home prices. <laughs> and then we have this great neighborhood over here, the South End, and, you know, various different other things come into play in different parts of the city. But you can see you can see how useful it can be to map many different social phenomena and get a better idea of your, your data layout. You don't have to do that, of course. There are also interesting patterns in the data um, if you look at it non-spatially. Actually, I'm going to skip that. I'm not going to do any more experimentation pixie dust, but you get the idea. So. I just spent 15 minutes looking at various different data visualizations without ever looking up a command. And, you know, I probably, if I was doing matplotlib Python programming from scratch, in 10, 15 minutes, I may have gotten one or two graphics out for you. Now I'm gonna to go to the next step, which is um, Pixie apps. So Pixie, so after writing Pixie Dust, we realized that, okay, so we've created a library of pretty useful, quick um, visualization options, but one size doesn't fit all. People are going to want to do something a little bit different, create some interactivity, allow their collaborators to, to basically have a little bit of control over what they see. And we don't want, we don't expect people, even though it's open source, we don't expect people to take Pixie Dust as is and write new code, um, write new code for it, extend it. It's a pretty big code library. And if we only allowed people to, to modify it by reading all the source code, we'd have a small audience, very small audience. So what we decided was to create a extensibility layer on top of Pixie Dust, which we called Pixie Apps, which gives you hooks into Pixie Dust. You can call all the data visualization commands and you can get access to all the data processing commands, but you're writing your own small little Python app. And I'm gonna show you how that works really quickly in a few minutes here. So learn by demo. Learn by doing is always the best way. We can't, we're not in a, we're virtual here, so we can't all be doing this yourself. But if you do happen to have a Jupyter Notebook up and running, you can, you can do this yourself. So I'm gonna import the Pixie app library here from pixiedust.display.app, import everything. And then I'm gonna have, here's my first little hello world app application. I should call this hello world, actually. <laughs> So I'm going to annotate, this is just Python code, actually a combination of Python and Jinja2 templating. Pixie Dust is all a combination of Python and Jinja2 templating. 
and Jinja 2 is a live Python library which lets you mix and match a little bit of HTML and JavaScript in with your Python. So I'm going to annotate. This is all Python here, Python annotation. Annotate with Pixie app, which sets up some, you know, some basic requirements I need to run a Pixie app. I'm going to create a Python class here, call it Pick Simple App 1. I'm going to define one route, the default route. And the default route calls a, a method called main here. And all I'm going to do is return some HTML. Let's run this. So I returned a title, an H1 element. And I returned an input element, input type equals button. So that's interesting because now we're introducing the ability for to take some take some input from our user. We're not just presenting them with some data or some view of the data. We're allowing them to give us some feedback on, on what they want. So right now that button doesn't do anything. I didn't write any code to make it do anything. The next step shows you how, as the uh, little documentation here shows, and this notebook is available to you. I shared the URL in the presentation slides that are available. So this app shows how to call a function using user input from an HTML control. Notice how each function's response completely replaces the content in the cell. So now we're going to do the same thing, annotate with Pixie app, new class called Simple App 2. Now we have two routes, our default route, once more. We put a little title on it, and we create a, an input control. But now we have this non-HTML, this will look strange to you if you know HTML, this PD options attribute of the input element, which is specific to Pixie apps. This is basically saying, this is basically routing, providing a little routing functionality within the application. So if when you click it, set Pixie does options clicked equal to true. So this class will be called again when the uh, when the button is clicked, but now PD options the clicked parameter will be set to true, and so we'll go to this route instead of the default route. This is the route that gets called when clicked equals true, and so what we're going to show there is um, another input button. So this is just allows us to toggle between clicked equals true and clicked equals false. So I click that, now you see this, you click, now go back, you'll see that is what we said to show when clicked equals true. This input value equals you click, now go back. Click that, and we'll see what was in it. Click it again, we'll see another route. So that's okay, so now we have some user interaction. This is really, seems very basic, but it's the, you know, it's the foundation of being able to do interesting things, because now we have the ability for the user to change the state of our application. Plus, we have the whole Pixie Dust um, core there, which allows us to take data and visualize it. So now, oh, one more little step here where I show how you don't have to update the whole cell. When you click something, you can, there's another Pixie Dust option here called PD Target, which lets you target a particular uh, DOM element. So if you give your divs in your HTML a particular ID, you can target that ID and only put HTML content in that, in that DOM element. So now you'll see that the title, Simple App 3, doesn't refresh the way it did before. Well, that was, you know, that's great. Now we have some basics of interaction built. Now let's see, let's add, we have to add data to it. So just to, just to make things interesting, I'm going to pull in a different sample data set here, sample data set number one, which is some old data on car performance from the 70s, I think. Pull that CSV file in. Now I have a much more involved Pixie app here. I'm going to just walk through it quickly because I want to leave some time for questions. But we have, uh, once more, decorated with Pixie app, class data frame app. We have a setup method now, which runs as soon as the uh, class gets called. So what I'm doing here is I am initializing this data frame or this Pixie app with uh, a data frame, pulling it in 
here. And I just set up some variables. I want the DF variable to be the data frame, and I want the calls variable self.calls to be all the columns, column names. Another little another little uh, detail that you'll learn if you learn Pixie apps is at template args is another decorator you have to use to be able to use variables inside your function here. Um, so we're gonna set up some basic, I'm gonna run this. It's easier to understand when you run it. Set up my title here, my H1 data frame app. Now I'm creating a little, I'm using Bootstrap, Bootstrap uh, CSS framework a Drawer JavaScript framework, combination of CSS and JavaScript. It comes for free in Jupyter Notebooks because Jupyter Notebooks uses it. So that's the CSS library we always use. So you don't have to load any new one in. So Bootstrap lets you create a panel, just basically makes your user interface looks better. I create a panel, I give the panel a title called Select a Column. And then in the panel body, I'm creating a Select dropdown which is standard HTML. But if you read this carefully, you'll see I'm pulling the data for my select dropdown from the actual data frame. So um, this is a little Jinja 2 syntax, but what I'm doing here is populating the options for the select from this self.column, from the columns variable I set up here, the calls. So when I run this, you'll see I get this dropdown of all the column names from that car's performance data set I set up. MPG, cylinders, engine, horsepower, all these things. So that is the basics of how to start working with um, uh, Pixie apps. You can see the power now that you've integrated user interactivity with your, with your data frame, you can do a lot of interesting things. I was gonna show you some that doesn't seem to be working now. So I was gonna show you how you can select, a, have the user select a column here from the data set and, uh, and, see the, and see the visualization of the column there. For some reason, my last, my last cell isn't working properly right now. That's unfortunate. <laughs> I'm not gonna debug it on the fly here. Okay, well, I can't show you the big bang at the end. But um, hopefully that gives you a flavor. So basically what I was trying to do here at the end was show you that if you populate, after you select a value from here, out of all these column names, you can send the value that was selected into this other Build a special command we built called our special attribute called PD options, which says, which basically creates one of those visualizations from Pixie Dust using the metadata that I showed you earlier. I showed you that every cell can have JSON metadata. Um, we can also pass that metadata directly into the Pixie Dust framework to create a graphic not in JSON, but as a basically a key value list. So a lot of these things I showed you earlier are present here. So when a user selects an option for the drop-down menu, which will be one of these names, acceleration, MPG, um, et cetera, cylinders, engine, horsepower. As soon as the user selects one of those, I'm gonna pass handle ID as histogram, gonna make a histogram of it. I'm gonna use my Brunel renderer I'm gonna use, um, for the value fields, I'm going to use that thing that the user selected here. I'm gonna bin the data into 10 groups, use 5,000 values from the data set and all those other things I used to set up a chart. And uh, for some reason that wasn't working at this moment, but uh, we can get it working together if you want to. <laughs> so that is, believe that is yeah so that's what I wanted to show today and I hope that gave you a good taste of how you can reduce context switching when you're work when you're doing data science work at the end of this whole thing you may need to 
you may need to go back and actually hand code a, a graphic by hand if it's for an important presentation, something like that. But as you're doing the daily day-to-day -day work, doing exploratory data visualization, getting to the place, getting to the right insight that you actually want to show other people, uh, it's very, Pixie Dust is really valuable for not, for, for productivity gains, for not losing your place in your, in your, in your work and keeping your flow going. Also, a lot of other, com um, a lot of other export parts of Pixie Dust I didn't even show. You can export to the web, export a nice visualization to the web, even build a little web interface publicly. The, the interface I showed you will work great in a Jupyter Notebook, but often you would just want a pure HTML version put on, put as a web app on a website, and that's possible too. So that was a quick round whirlwind tour of Pixie Dust. And I don't know if I can take questions here. Yeah, so somebody asks, is this a Jupyter Notebook? Yes, it is a Jupyter Notebook. It's uh, skinned for the IBM Watson Studio product. You know, we changed a little bit of the CSS to make it match our branding, but it is, it's a uh, standard Jupyter Notebook. So thanks, Mohan, for talking a little bit about where you can find more on data science and AI-related stuff at IBM. And I think that's, uh, okay, one more question from David. So the Pixie apps is less open source than Pixie Dust itself. Oh, I'm sorry to make that clear. Pixie, De Pixie apps are also open source. Pixie app, in terms of the open source project, um, Pixie apps are just another part of Pixie Dust. And I'm gonna, it's, it's a good idea. I'm going to show, so we've actually moved Pixie Dust from our own uh, GitHub repo. We're actually incubating it into the Apache Foundation so that it will be governed by an open source committee and not controlled by us. So it's, you know, being more and more a pure open source package and Pixie Dust includes Pixie apps. So github.com slash Pixie Dust and you'll see the core library here, Pixie Dust. Pixie Gateway is another piece, which is the web publishing. Um, Pixie Dust Node is a little add-on to Pixie Dust that lets you write Node.js code inside a Jupyter Notebook instead of Python. Some other things here, one of these here is the Pixie app extension, but there's a lot of different interesting things on github.com slash Pixie Dust. I'll take another question. So Francisco asks, I wasn't able to find a feature roadmap. What are some of the missing and upcoming features? Good point. So this has been a volunteer effort for a while. We're not as we're not as um, you know well organized around doing things a real product would have, like a feature roadmap and, and things like that. So you know it's an effort of a few people. Uh, we focus most of our time on making sure all the features are rock solid. Um, I cannot tell you if there are any big planned features right now. I think we're kind of in a kind of in a stabilization um, place here. But you know, if you want to jump on the GitHub issues and ask uh, a question or request a feature, people are looking at that every day. Okay, thanks everybody.